Hello, everyone. Welcome you all to the Social Enterprise and Rural Revitalization Contest Trends and Best Practices in China, which is a serious forum featuring social enterprises and rural revitalization across three countries' contents, China, Philippines, and Nepal, covering East, Southeast, and South Asia. I'm Lanning Zhang, leading a research and educational organization called Sources for Action, which is an outgrowth of the rural reconstruction movement in China and affiliated with the High Environmental Protection Foundation as one of its founders. Okay, on behalf of the RR Rural Revitalization Youth and Social Enterprise Platform, welcome you all again. The social entrepreneurship has emerged as a res response to the need to revitalize rural economy currently. In particular, social enterprise or social mission driven organizations that create social value and distribute wealth to the poor and marginalized in the rural areas have become a phenomenon in many countries in Asia. As part of this process, urban and rural youth are playing a key role. Thus, towards systemizing initiatives engaging the youth in revitalizing rural economies and as part of ensuring that recovering efforts from COVID-19 response to the needs of marginalized rural population, the Rural Revitalization Youth and Social Entrepreneurship Platform was launched in July 2022, co-convened by the Institute of Social Entrepreneurship in Asia, the Sources for Action, Rural Reconstruction Network in China, and the Philippine Rural Reconstruction Association, as well as the Nepal Rural Reconstruction Network. Consistent Consistent with the above objectives, this platform is organizing a forum series on social enterprise and rural revitalization, contest trends and best practice in Asia. This forum series aims to engage a dialogue about the development contest and trends on social enterprise engaged in rural revitalization in China, Nepal, and the Philippines. Showcase social enterprise contributing to rural revitalization and addressing the problems of aging farmers and out-migration issues. And the same time study how various segments of youth as stakeholders of social enterprise and leaders of innovative solutions to problem of rural communities can be more effectively supported. So this forum series will feature social enterprise and rural, rural revitalization across three countries. So China on, December, on November 24, Nepal on December 1st, and Philippines on December 17. This forum series will invite practitioners, policymakers, scholars, and students of uh, sustainable rural development and social entrepreneurship. Participants will include student and youth organizations, social enterprise, civil society organizations, and academic institutions, governments, and multilateral agencies, the private sector, as well as other stakeholders interested in engaging the youth and social entrepreneurship towards rural, revi rural revitalization and sustainable development. So before we go to the forum uh, major parts, uh, there are some logistic arrangement. We have the English and the Chinese channel. So there's the English interpretation to Chinese and Chinese interpreters to the English. And um, uh, this is supported by the worldwide 
is a also social first social enterprise in language services in China. And uh, thanks for their support. At the same time, we also uh, collaborate with the uh, Earth Village, and uh, they also actively participate will participate in this forum. Yeah. Okay, now let me invite Lisa Dapenai, the president of the Institute of Social Entrepreneurship in Asia, to briefly introduce ASEA and the RRUs and the social enterprise platform. Lisa, please. Thank you, Lan Ying. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I would like to just um, speak in behalf of uh, ISEA and the platform co-conveners of the Rural Revitalization Youth and Social Entrepreneurship Platform um, to welcome you all. No? ISEA, or the Institute for Social Entrepreneurship in Asia, is a regional network of social enterprises, resource institutions supporting social entrepreneurship, and scholars doing research and education on social enterprise in Asia, uh, and we are advancing social entrepreneurship for sustainable and equitable development. We were set up in 2008, and we are based in the Philippines, and we cover 10 countries in Asia. The Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, and Cambodia in Southeast Asia, Japan, Singapore, and China in East Asia, and India and Nepal in South Asia. Um, the Rural Revitalization Youth and Social Entrepreneurship Platform is one of five platforms set up by the Institute for Social Entrepreneurship in Asia and its partners in response to the multiple crises that we face. No? Uh, even before COVID-19, there was already a development crisis. We have a climate crisis, and this was made worse by the COVID-19 pandemic and now the impact of geopolitical wars that are happening. So the Rural Revitalization Youth and Social Entrepreneurship Platform is one of these five platforms for inclusive recovery, building back fairer, and accelerating the sustainable development goals. In particular, the Rural Revitalization Youth and Social Entrepreneurship Platform shall serve as a platform for learning exchange on rural revitalization, youth and social entrepreneurship, because rural revitalization is such a very it's is such an important part of uh, sustainable development. And the youth as actors is a very, uh, are, are very uh, critical to the rural revitalization process as social entrepreneurs and social innovators. The platform will also project collective impact on the marginalized sectors and rural communities we serve that are led by or focused on engaging youth towards rural revitalization. The third objective of the platform is to develop and advocate changes in government policy and programs relevant to engaging youth as key stakeholders in social entrepreneurship as pathway to rural revitalization and sustainable development. And fourthly, we'd like to generate support from private donors, financial institutions, national and international government bodies, as well as the business sector to broaden impact and the practice of cross-sectoral collaboration, supportive of social entrepreneurship as a pathway to rural revitalization and sustainable development. Um, with uh, this forum, uh, especially um, part of a series that I, has already been explained by Lan Ying, and uh, we're hoping that uh, we will be engaging youth and other actors who are in who are interested in um, engaging youth for rural revitalization, for uh, sustainable development. And uh, in the process, uh, we hope to broaden uh, the constituency of this platform uh, and uh, promote you know, um, the platform's objectives. So welcome to the, uh, to the forum. And we look forward to uh, engaging all of you uh, in uh, succeeding activities uh, beyond this forum. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa, for your welcome remarks. So uh, this is the first forum as Lisa, uh, as we planned. And uh, this first one will consist of three parts. One is a uh, content, uh, contest trends 
and uh, practices in uh, content and trends. And then we will have some kind of review of the uh, evolution of development in China of the social enterprise, and especially engagement in the rural revitalization. That's the second part. And third part is more the experiences from four cases. And uh, later, we also have a kind of a open uh, free dialogue uh, towards the end for 30 uh, minutes, if you like. You can still uh, keep uh, uh, joining it. Okay, so before we go for the uh, uh, first part, and uh, as an organizer, uh, we, we will have a group photo first. So please, we invite all of you to open your videos and uh, take a photo. Okay, I will wait for Buzz to tell me when it's finished. Okay. So we're quite uh, diversified. Okay. So many people from different. Okay, ready? Finished? Snapchat first. First, uh, oh. group first, smile. Mm. We have four mm. panels. Smile. Okay. Mm. Finish, let me. Okay. Okay, so. Now we go to the first part, the contest trends and social enterprise and rural revitalization, as well as youth role. So today we're so glad to be able to have Professor Wen, who is a renowned expert on social economic sustainable development and rural issues, especially in policy studies, macroeconomy, geostrategies of South-South cooperation, cooperation and long-term inclusive growth. Today, he's bringing his observations and perspective based on his five decades of micro and macro field research and analysis, as well as comparative studies in developing countries across the world. So, Professor Wen, please, you have 20 minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me first give you a, my PPT. And the, the PPT, uh, people can choose in Chinese and uh, English, and you can look at the, on the upper right side, there is a kind of uh, uh, a choice for the, uh, 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 for the audio video, and the uh, PPT will be in two uh, parts. It's my great pleasure to share with you some of my observations on China's social enterprises. As I grow older, I'm speaking not really good English, so I better use Chinese. And we have translators today. And today I'm going to talk about how we need social enterprises in promoting rural revitalization. First of all, I would like to introduce the importance of social enterprises in rural revitalization. So first of all, some big context. Maybe some of you have already felt that we are going through a global economic crisis and the cause of it is the oversupply of capital. In the capitalist world, 
Right now, they are not paying a lot of attention to this issue. However, if we follow the rules of market economy, then excessive capital means that its importance as a production factor is reduced. And then many social production factors like culture, ecology, etc. These production factors will be more important. And in this big context, how can we turn social sources into social capital? That has become the source of income for many social enterprises. And social enterprises are actually born out of the Western economic crisis. We know that these Western countries, especially the United States, have already entered a stage of high debt. The US and also Japan have a debt rate of over 300%. And the debt level of the United States alone can't be met even by the total global supply global GDP, the US couldn't pay back. So we're not only seeing this oversupply of capital, but also the over indebtedness, especially the debt level of developed countries. Well, if you're interested, you can look for some data and also related facts. A lot of the developed countries now are regarded as high, highly debted countries very different from the 80s and 90s when developing countries were deeply in debt. And developing countries were actually under the pressure and then they were seeing a lot of social unrest and also social issues. But now on the contrary, Western countries, developed countries, especially the United States are highly indebted, but they are not planning to pay the debt back. And they even set up association or some alliance to avoid paying their debt back. That's why we're having the global governance deterioration. So these countries not only see oversupply of capital, but also high debt level. That's why a lot of the developed countries face high inflation. So you see this excessive capital, high debt level, and also inflation. These are the root causes of the capitalism seeing difficulty right now. In this big context, many Western businesses are transitioning to social enterprises. They're transitioning from listed businesses that emphasize corporate social responsibility to emphasizing social enterprises. Many multinational companies are also transitioning. And also with the importance of social production factors increases, many micro and small medium sized enterprises and some small sized economies are also transitioning to social enterprises. So these are some of the international backgrounds. And also in China, we're seeing some changes. Before the reform, enterprises and the society are closely interlinked. They can't be separated. We emphasized the whole process guarantee. So it's about their, for example, employees, and also the family members of the employees, we all have social security. And from the 70s and 80s, China also had pretty high debt level. And due to the debt pressure, we have to change our domestic system. We have to change the previous model. So we have started a process of desocialization of enterprises and the general public 
also experienced a stage of deorganization. And then there is this deinstitution. So these individual workers are susceptible to exploitation. And right now, China also sees excessive supply of capital, and we focus people centeredness. And we have ruled out the poverty reduction and also rural revitalization initiatives, and also the ecological civilization and urban rural integration initiatives. So we are transitioning from pro-capital to pro-people's livelihood, pro-environment, pro the poor. So we are transitioning from pro-capital to pro-environment, pro-poor. So the general public is then organized and many community-based enterprises are also st started to transition, including some new collective. Previously, it was collective economy, and this has become a major force of reform. And now we are rebuilding collective organizations. This is closely linked to, to rural revitalization and also consistent with rural cultural regeneration. And they are all connected. And because of the strategy of urban rural integration, a lot of opportunities were created for social enterprises. A lot of the urbanites actually go back to rural areas to start businesses with farmers. There are over 10 million of them that are working with farmers. And mostly they focus on grain development. They focus on protecting the environment and resources. This is why social enterprises are making a comeback in China. Right now, we still have to build the discourse around social enterprises in China. Because in China, right now the discourse around social enterprises is actually from the West. So there is the lack of understanding of social enterprises, especially in terms of the Chinese context, the Chinese history, Right now, we only see some social service institutions, community public interest enterprises, and also public non-enterprise units, etc. But we are not combining our history and also our Chinese reality with the social enterprises. That's why we need to focus on the history of social enterprises in China. It has been here for a long time. It can be dated back to 2000 years ago because China's history is mostly dominated by the agriculture and mostly we settle in rural areas. So it is socialized. It is not focused on individual interests, very different from the West. In China, we have always had common behavior, common assets, and also we have the practice of turning social resources into our asset. So our philosophy is when we share resources, can we coexist together? So that is to use natural resources to maintain our lifestyle. And also our production method is deeply grounded into our nature. So in China, we always have common land. We have shared rivers and shared facilities. And in some places, this kind of shared land can account for 80% of the total. So 
So this is to use shared land to create shared benefits. And this has been going on in China for thousands of years. And then in modern China, especially since the Opium War, when China was invaded by Western imperialists, and then there was the movement of industries saving China. And this is not to maximize profit, but to maximize the interests of the general public of the country with aim to save the country. So these social enterprises are patriotic, are nationalistic. In developing country, nationalism is a positive word. It is closely connected to patriotism, which is very different from the West, from the connotation in the Western context. That's why we need to focus on building our own discourse. And that's all for this part. We need to focus on the historical experience. And in China's history, we have some pioneers of social enterprises. And this is what I want to focus on next. In the early stages, Chinese social enterprises focused on rational use of local resources. At that time, China was invaded and divided up by Western imperialists. So saving the country is the mission for everyone. And for China and these latecomers, we can't just resort to colonialism. We have to focus on resource accumulation locally. This is how local businesses can grow. And this is how they can compete with those multinational companies in China. So the characteristic of social enterprises in China is actually a shareholding cooperative. And also it is the property localization or internalization. This can prevent, prevent externalities, especially negative externalities. So an important mechanism of social enterprises is to mobilize resources and to become part of business growth. So in that stage, the social enterprises are deeply rooted in China's agrarian society, in China's traditional culture. And the basis of it is to have a fair and just profit sharing mechanism so that we can turn social resources into social profit. This is very different from the Western context. And here is an example, the earliest social enterprise set up in 1895 called Da Sheng Company. We know at the time there was a war in China and China lost. And Mr. Zhang Jian at the time was, was, was a kind of the Minister of Commerce. At the time, he quitted his job. During the war, he withdrew from the battlefield and he thought the failure was a shame. So he quitted the job and returned to his hometown, Nantong, to grow its local, to grow its local cooperative or social enterprise. And he has contributed to local development. He set up over 20 businesses and 370 schools and set up agribusiness 
and also set up many institutions to help the poor, the vulnerable, the marginalized. They really benefit the general public. The philosophy that is supported by the Confucian, Confucianism. So they are not after personal interests. They focus on maximizing social interests. So what can we take from this? And why social enterprises can grow? Because they have positive externality mechanism and they can achieve local accumulation. They are not taking resources from other places like the West. So they have to make full use of local resources to create value from that and to innovate capital accumulation so that they can increase their capital. We know this is a process of prioritizing capital, but in social enterprises, they have to focus on labor. That's why setting up schools and helping the poor, the vulnerable, setting up vocational training schools are some of the most effective ways to mobilize social resources. That's why all of the profits from this company have been used for building people's livelihood. So, this is very effective to mobilize local resources for the benefit of local communities. So these social enterprises have their own mission. They also have their own business models. And localization is the basis for social enterprises. So we can see that social enterprises have been here for a long time, since ancient times. And this is also an effective way to mobilize social resources to contribute to social progress. As long as every community is developing, then the local region is. So we are reducing the administration cost by combining these two measures. Okay, so that, that's enough. Let's move on to the modernization. So the contemporary innovation for social enterprises, which has a clear development, in rural areas, they can reorganize their assets to form a new collective economy, including the old version of a collective economy. Of course, they can also have a trinity to localize their economy parallel to integration of rural and uh, urban areas, plus the government's taking the risk of investment, which matters so much, offering policies to help the closing of their association. So based on the experiences, the rural development in the reform Let's take a look at the farmers' employment and the community welfare, and the sustainable development of community resources, and the last, the benefits of the enterprises themselves. So the villagianism with Chinese characteristics from 1980s to 1990s have boomed all around. However, because of the sanctions imposed by U.S. and other countries, plus with economic crisis, the rural enterprises declined. And in the contemporary, entering the 21st century, we have renewed our rural construction, promoting the wide participation from, from different societies 
parties. And this is the rural construction campaign, which is a revitalization for social enterprises. We can see that a wide of social enterprises based on pursuit of social benefits to encourage comprehensive development instead of individual benefits. So let's jump to a conclusion. We're adopting the out resources to boost the green development, to improve the rural governance, to innovate the organization. So this is what rural organization is all about. We need institutional innovation. We need different industries to support the social enterprises. They have multi functions, they have multi forms, leading to a game and to form a good circle. I'm afraid the time is limited, so that's all my sharing. Thank you. You're muted. Sorry. Okay, thanks, Professor Wen. Yeah, <clears throat> it's really uh, kind of inspiring and uh, directive for us to understand uh, the different paths uh, looking from the historical experience as well as the uh, modern ex uh, innovation. And uh, we hope that we have a further, in the future, have more uh, in-depth dialogue uh, and uh, uh, exchange. Yeah. So um, now uh, we are inviting a young leader who is actively supporting social enterprise development in China. And uh, his name is Liu Xuanqi. He's the founder and chair chairman of the board of the social enterprise world in Beijing. He created various platforms and events, including 100 Social Entrepreneurs Investment Committee, Social Enterprise Week, Village Social Enterprise for Rural Revitalization Plan, Social Village Township Plan, etc. cetera. And uh, he also represents youth to participate in various national and international uh, and to, uh, platform or a conference, for example, G20 Youth Forum. And, um, and he is playing uh, quite uh, also playing as a mentor coaching to the college students to support them to uh, explore, to be in to develop the innovative and uh, social innovative social enterprise. And uh, supported by the Minister of Education Youth League. Okay, now, uh, Xuan Qi, please. I'm trying to, yeah. within the time, huh? Mm. Uh, can you mm. help share my PPT? Yeah, Ruo Ying can help, yeah. Go through to the next slide, yeah. It is my pleasure to participate in this forum. And following Professor Wen, let's move on to a new sharing. Professor Wen has also, also introduced the origins and the history of rural revitalization. So inspired by Professor Wen, I'm going to share the development of social enterprises in China. The time is limited. So I will only pick some key points. China is the homeland of social enterprises, including the Yichang, Yichang in ancient China. But unlike the traditional philanthropy organizations, the fundings they collected are used for common welfare. And until now, Yichang still exists. The social enterprises 
is not news in China. The word social enterprises came from the West and we translated in Chinese as social enterprises. But China offers the best environment for social enterprises, no matter in traditional culture or in collective economy. Of course, Professor Wen mentioned the Dashen Group in recent China, which was a representative company actually compared with international social enterprises, this one shared some similarities. The goal was to solve social issues instead of individual profits. It see companies as the welfare for the common influenced by the Confucian culture. using commercial methods instead of some industrial measures by collecting funds. But unlike the stock joint enterprises in China by one share, one vote, it was limiting the some huge shareholders, guarantee the rights of some small shareholders. So the system is targeting the benefits of all to share benefits for all. All the benefits was flowing into social practices, nearly all. Because when Zhang Jian grew old, he even sold his works and funded commonwealths using this money. So he is a social entrepreneur, a very representative model. Actually, not just Zhang Jian, there are still many more. Let's take a look at the development of social enterprises started by Mr. Zhang Jian, and then Lu Zofu, and Chairman Mao in his youth. He also started his business inspired by Mr. Zhang Jian. When I was reading the early scripts in before 1921, actually he mentioned Zhang Jian, which inspired him, of course, including the villagism, a world introduced by Zhang Zuoren from Japan. Chairman Mao followed this thought. And uh, let's move on to Peking University in 1998. The university started, started um, cooperative. That was the first in university. And then Mr. Lu Zofu. And the rural townships in 1980s. It is not emerged out of sudden, which is a continuation of social enterprise in group. We can't actually call them as social enterprises. They sound similar, and the first means they are targeted for commonwealths using commercial methods without political ends, only a market entity to participate in in the 1970s, it was a huge success, accounting for 40% of Chinese GDP. And later, after the opening and reform, it has evolved into rural enterprises and now the private sectors. So as early as four to five decades ago, China has already started its development of rural enterprises. Owned by all workers to solve social issues. 
This is a topic to share and the study within it is increasing. After entering the new century, a book influenced so many social entrepreneurs, we can even call it a Bible for social entrepreneurs, named How to Influence the World. Most entrepreneurs, the first generation entrepreneurs, read it, including some famous entrepreneurs. One of them even named him as social founding of entrepreneurship because we don't communicate that much with the West. So we don't know that it is a demanding industry with international consensus. After the book published, many people started to practice. And in 2006, there is another accident. A Chinese people won the Nobel Peace Prize. And Peking University has held a organization for future entrepreneurships, a milestone marking that China, especially the youth in China, is starting to pay attention to it. And later, Chengdu, with an organization in Britain, has published a organization. And I was the second generation of these trainees. Of course, I have read this book mentioned above in 2006. My graduation thesis was even based on that. And this trend continued to 2017, training 30 people for every forum. So in 2015, different foundations and organizations have co-publicized a forum, a social service investment forum, and later it was renamed. Until now, it is the biggest forum in the related industry, such as in Hong Kong, it has a high level summit, in Oxford University, it has a, its own summit, and the same in China. Since 2016, a social enterprise service platform emerged, relying on a charity organization to certify different social enterprises, because in the past, Everyone has its own standings for these enterprises. So now we have a common certification of such enterprises. In 2018, Chengdu City has launched its official policy to certify. And we can say that Chengdu City is the best, has the best environment to the development of social enterprises. If you want to register as a social enterprise, you have to use a part of your investment for Commonwealth, dividing the philanthropic organizations. And now let's move on in 2022, the Way Social Enterprise Award emerged. We are the co-planners of this award, which is the highest level for social enterprises award. The winner could have a 100,000 100, scholarship. And the CPC is endorsing it, marking that the Chinese government starts to participate in. And in 2012, the youth creation competition started to propose. Last year, more than 2,000 entrepreneurs have participated in. And this year, jumping to more than 5,000. So in recent years, China is developing fast in related industry. And then the Chinese State Council, a center belonging to the State Council has launched policies 
And during the two summits, there are also some related policies. And Beijing has also launched related policies to it. 像社会或者是环境目标，这个大概就是社企、社社会企业、中国社会企业发展的一个简单的一个一个一个脉络啊。This is the timeline of social enterprises in China. And next, 我们我们也在这个基础之基础之中，也是在做一个社会推推动者啊，推动者。And we have also made some explorations in social enterprises. So we want to be a global social enterprise platform. Not just for Chinese social enterprises. That's why it's very privileged for us to attend this international forum. We mainly have three focuses. First, rural revitalization. How rural economies can transition to social enterprises, and also the second focus is community-based enterprises or social enterprises. And thirdly, is youth development. How we how we can engage young people, and this is also. Where we are best at, we are working with the government to launch activities to engage young people to be part of the social enterprise movement. Our vision is to, in the next ten years, we want to make social enterprises to account for ten percent of the total numbers of enterprises. Right now, we don't have enough number of social enterprises in China. They are still in the early stage. That's why we want to increase people's understanding of social enterprises in China. That's why we have launched the Hundred People Forum on Rural Revitalization to identify some of the case studies and share that with the general public. And we have also started the World Entrepreneur Conference. To find those entrepreneurs that can be involved in our initiative, and also we are making some campaign in community level. We engage those resident owners. And on top of that, we are also turning those property companies into social enterprises. And jointly run by landowners. For example, we also have consumer co cooperatives. We also have many rankings on social entrepreneurship, youth, and also social enterprises. We also have the top 500 social enterprises in China, and we also have our incubators, and also our communities like our social entrepreneurs club. We are also working on the China Social Entrepreneurship Museum. Because social enterprises in China has a long history, and right now in Hunan there is a fund that has set up an exhibition to showcase the development of social enterprises, and we have also set up social enterprise research institute to focus on research in this aspect. So we need to give our own definition of social enterprises. Because after all, China is a very large country, and we need to have our own definition, which is different from that in the West. We also want to roll our definition, roll our ideas to the world, and we have been doing this for four years. And we also have social enterprise festival and also social enterprise week to roll out many activities. And next, I would like to talk about social enterprises in villages. How to build villages that have good social enterprises? This is not the first in China because it was actually first started in the UK, where a village has thirty social enterprises. So, what kind of villages in China can be turned into social enterprise villages? First of all, its collective economy can be turned to social enterprises, and this enterprise can invest in other enterprises. It is based on mutual sharing and also mutual contribution. It is not about profit maximization for individuals, but for the general public. 
And right now we have some examples here, some villages here, as you can see in the pictures. And for communities, we mainly focus on how to make our communities better. And for youth development, we set up competition to engage young people. And we have also carved out our Chinese model of social enterprises. It has many features. And this definition can be different from the West. For example, the dividend is, can be differ, different between China and the rest of the world. And in China, if you have th three, uh, a third of the dividend, then you can have a veto right. We want to ensure that the mission can be committed to. And also you need to mobilize social resources to channel those resources to develop social enterprises. And you also need to tap into the power of the public. And of course, we have to get resources from capital to mobilize social fund. So this is our features. This is our system. And this is also our exploration that we are making right now. And we also have some future prospects for Chinese enterprises. So first of all, we hope that some private businesses can become social enterprises. For example, nuclear testing industry that has been very popular right now, this has to become a social enterprises. You have to have social supervision because private companies will try to maximize their profits and this could lead to many issues. That's why in public service industries, these private businesses have to be, have to be social enterprises. And second, how we can grow many social enterprises from some welfare organizations. We've already have many good examples here in China. And thirdly, we need to engage young people in setting up social enterprises. And we will also launch our training program for young people to train them into social entrepreneurs. And fourthly, also the integration of social enterprises with blockchain and metaverse. The core of blockchain and also metaverse is actually mutual sharing. It is distributed. It is not owned by anyone. So these technologies can help us mobilize more resources. And finally, we can explore many different types of social enterprises. Social enterprises can take in different forms. So that's our hope for the future. So in conclusion, social enterprises is to mobilize social resources to produce the best benefits. And there is also a system behind it And how you can grow the social enterprise is actually based on a systematic approach. And that's all for my sharing today. And I really hope that more people can understand and engage in social enterprises, especially we can achieve so much more in rural realizations and even make a difference in the world. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks very much, uh, Xuan Qi, who present uh, the evolution or development from the very early 100 years ago to now, the social enterprise development in different uh, time period in his view, and also act what he has been done actively to support different type of social enterprise development in different social settings in rural or community or the business sector. Yeah. And uh, we wish that the more youth uh, could be could um, be trained and or actively innovatively join the social enterprise development in China. Okay, now we are <clears throat> go we're entering, we're starting the third part, which is the 
experience sharing. And uh, we invite four speakers. All of them are very young. Yeah, some of them are youth return home and explore various type of uh, uh, social enterprise. First, let us invite Mr. Feng Zhongde. He's the manager of a good products commune, which was supported by the China Foundation for Poverty Elevation. But now it is named as the China Rural Revitalization Foundation. Since it's uh, uh, established the, as a social enterprise, the good product commune has served, provide service to farmers for their products in, in many counties. And Nisa Feng also accumulated a lot of experience, practical experience in rural industry development, cooperative organizational cultivation, new farmers training and brand building for farmer products. He will present good product commune as a, I mean, the good products commune as a platform which has mobilized all social forces to support the poor and marginalized rural communities to be out of poverty. So, Zhongde, please, you have 15 minutes. Thank you for your introduction. It's my great pleasure to attend this forum and also share with you our good products commune, our practices in helping farmers. Just now, Professor Wen and also have also offered us a lot of insights. We can definitely echo that. So we are a social public interest organization. I would like to share with you four parts today. First of all, the background. As a public interest organization, as we are involved in poverty alleviation and rural revitalization, apart from offering motivation, offering some basic support, how can we really drive local development to achieve sustainable income increase? And we have found some of the bottlenecks or some of the challenges. First of all, right now, farmers are decentralized. There is no economic of steel, scale. And second, the efficiency is low, including the every technology, machinery, and also grain inputs are not enough. And thirdly, short chains. Most of the products are locally produced. And then there is um, very limited channels of value added. There are lack of information to the market. There is the information asymmetry. And lastly, low profits. Farmers only do the farming and do the agriculture and they don't have a lot of income. That's why based on all of these issues, We want to address these issues, improve efficiency, build brands, increase income, and to make farmers more organized so that they can grow together. We also, we mainly have three aspects. First of all, we leverage cooperatives to improve the efficiency, to improve their service quality, and second, the key is the products and services along the industrial chain to elongate the industrial chain. And the thirdly, we want to use village collective and cooperative to boost the standard and quality. That is the foundation. So we use cooperative as the basis and use our platform to empower farmers. We want to build a trustworthy brand. And right now, Chinese consumers 
actually they want trust. That's why as a social enterprise, we really hope that we can improve quality control to build specific and unique brands to gain recognition from consumers. And we hope we can act as a bridge connecting farmers and consumers. Our vision is to allow farmers to work with dignity and to allow consumers to have healthy products. So that we can contribute to a com to a virtuous cycle in agriculture in rural areas. We started in 2014 and in 2015, we set up the China Foundation for Rural Development. And so far, we actually own the exclusive investment into China Foundation for Rural Development, which can ensure that we can help realize our mission and vision without external influence. And we have already helped 40,000 households across 138 cooperatives. And we also gained recognition to become a certified social enterprise. And also in 2020, we won many awards. For example, the awards from the 2020 China Public Interest Enterprise. So we have four major aspects in our business. With cooperatives help, we improve quality, build brands, train professionals to involve households in the production, improve their competitiveness and pre premium so as to increase their income. So the farmers can be the owners of their property rights and major stakeholders and workforce for development. So we focus on services to, to the farmers. We have a team to organize all of the resources and a cooperative will shore up other services for farmers. And we also build social safety net for low income population. Right now we are working with a hundred cooperatives and we also have profit sharing with them. Apart from profit incomes, profit, profit from products, farmers can also gain dividend. We hope to unite people with cooperation, drive rural revitalization by growing industries. We hope that our communities can achieve their social value, not just economic value. While we are promoting cooperatives, we have found the importance of talent. That's why we also set up our first training session for cooperative chairman. And we also set up a college and we offer different helps for chairman of cooperative around the country. And in terms of production, we help farmers to be better engaged in agriculture. We set up our own team in terms of technology, technique, Hmm. 现在走了,嗯,现在是第一个,呃,四个业务板块,再往下走,因为你已经讲了第,在第二个部分了嘛,嗯。这会能看到了吧? 看得到了,嗯。
，你把那个视频边搜一下。你要还得往下走了，嗯。好，那行，我继续继续往下走、嗯，因为我这边全屏的话是正常在播，嗯、可能是网络的事儿、嗯嗯。啊，那往下，那我们在生产端呢，我们希望在在这个。Since in terms of production, we hope that quality is our top priority. 嗯，不是，我现在讲的就是这个以品控为抓手这个。对啊，没到品控，这样讲的是利益连接，连农带农增收，这个 PPT 是。再往下。现在能看到吗？现在是合作合作社，再往下。怎么很慢呢、啊？那是我们这网络的问题，应该是我们现在啊。那我们这边谁帮他放一下？嗯，你你听着用下吧。There's something wrong with the PPT, so please wait for a while. 龙翔可以帮他放吗？嗯，我可以来给你们送一下。你停止分享了吗？嗯，没错。你接着讲好吗？我我就在那。嗯。好。你接着讲。嗯。这样，啊，上品公社其实我们在。Okay, I will continue. The good product commune is utilizing the communities and the competitive, so each party could oversee and help the other and improve our quality. We have a base, a service station, a local group to form a safe package to trace the origin of our product. So the whole chain is transparent for our customers. And next, we're helping building the local brand to improve our brand's influencity and pursue the premium. Our own team is integrating different parties involving talents to dig and discover their own strengths from package to product to increase the influence and next we are helping our customers because the traditional technique may only solve the issues of organization and standard. But when we are connecting the market, what we do is special in terms of philanthropy organizations. We are integrating so many social resources, including Tencent, ButtDance, Alibaba, which are willing to use this platform to connect with us and helping the local farmers. During the pandemic, we helped a live stream in Hubei province to sell the products amounting to 8 million. 
helping their selling. And we also cooperated with ByteDance to sell the apples. We launched a certain campaign to call on NetEase to widely participate in this conception festival to enjoy the quality products with lower price with the aim to helping these farmers. And we also cooperated with property enterprises to pricely support the development by leveling the community, the property companies, the cooperatives. They could interact it and informing our customers the stories behind all in all to boost the sales. Now we have covered various regions involving provinces, counties, cooperatives, and we have set up demonstration bases. Developing more than 100 products amounting to more than 10 million RMB, the offline sales more than 120 million RMB, and the farmers benefited from it are countless. They are all cooperated with good product commune because of the time and apologized for the poor internet connection. So I didn't share all the details of my sharing. And I hope in the future we have opportunities to exchange more. Thank you. Uh, okay. Mm. Sorry for, I think, for the PPT. I think uh, uh, the good uh, products Camille had a quite a substantial systematic uh, establishment of uh, supporting the um, farmers in the poor regions to be out of poverty by mobilizing all the social forces. So at the community level, co farmer cooperative, and collective and supporting for the agricultural products quality control. But on the consumer side, they mobilize all the local leaders and um, uh, social uh, public figures, and also using the digital uh, internet uh, marketing and uh, help to, uh, to market the agricultural goods. So it's quite a substantial, intensive, uh, systematic establishment. So hopefully we will have some more time uh, to, to, to learn, uh, to exchange. And uh, so now we are, we are inviting the, another one who, who has been, uh, is also a youth uh, returning home. Uh, his name is Yao Huifeng. Yeah. He returned back to his village and um, jointly e established uh, ecological rice cooperatives. And he also lead the cooperatives uh, members to e establish rice milling, processing business, homestay business, farming, education, and successfully realize the integration of agricultural production, processing, and service, service industry. So he also has gained good reputation, such as a good model as national farmer cooperatives in 2020. Yeah. And she's, he's also rural youth leaders in, uh, in Jiangxi province. So Hui Feng, please. Uh, you have 15 minutes. Can anyone help share my PPT, please? Mm. Yao Hui Feng's PPT, I don't have it. Only Long Xiang has. I'm not able to share here. Don't share. 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 Don't share.
is uh, Yao Huifeng uh, is the host? Yes, he can share his screen. You can share his screen. You can share his screen. I can see the screen, but I can see the screen. You can see the screen, and you can see the screen. That's right? Then I'll open it, right? You can open your PPT. Yes. 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 好，可以了，你就可以打开你的 PPT 了。嗯、好嘞，好嘞，稍微慢一点。嗯，可以看到了 ，so you can start。嗯，能看到是吧，张老师？对，能看到了。嗯。啊，呃，张老师、温老师，各位朋友，大家好。哇，我是。Hello, friends. My name is Yao Huifeng. I use returning to the village in Jiangxi province. Today, I'm going to share with you my experiences. Since 2011. Working on cooperatives, leading farmers to do it. And now, what I've been done is already more than 12 years. And I'm continuing doing it. So today, I'm going to share with you my experiences. When I was young, since my parents were all farmers, and I growing up in the village. I worked to study hard because back then farming was so suffering and I entered the Southwest Forestry University. After graduation, I found a job in Beijing, the capital of China. I wanted to take a look at these big cities since 2005 and I stayed for five years later. I worked many years in these cities, but I don't gain a sense of belonging. Longing for my home in the village. Accidentally, in 2010, I learned that the central government has publicized a campaign in Xi'an and back then I was working in Guangzhou. So I spoke to CSA. After talking with their leader, I happened to know that a partnership in Hong Kong named CSA offered an internship. After considering I quitted my job to work as an intern, In Guangzhou, we would interact with customers, exchanging ideas about small skew farmers, and took a look at the farms to see how it operated. After the internship in 2011, after long consideration, I returned to my home a village in Jiangxi province. Although I grew up in village, but I spent many years working and studying in universities in different cities. So I'm not familiar with many labor in the field, like clearing the land, like seeding. So since I returned, I made up my mind to be a real farmer learning from zero. One year passed and I learned so many things to be how to be a real farmer. Mm -hmm. 
啊，不用农药化肥。When I just returned, farmers didn't leave without fertilization they could grow, but one year passed, they were convinced by me. Even with higher prices, so at the end of 2012, some smallholders reached me, and later I established the Daoxiang Nanyuan Cooperative, covering a wide range of lands, and their practices succeeded to later earn more compared with their income before. So more farmers joined from 10 to more farmers and we covered a wider range of farmlands, even gained an organic certification. Now we are selling the rice of our own product. Gradually, Until now, we have three townships covered farmers in dozens of villages. And we even developed as a demonstration base at the country level with wider influences and higher productivity. However, as you can see, the organic rice, its price is high. So we need to expand our channel to sell more, like deep processing and uh, immersive experiences, so more people can know it. And I found out many farmers now they are not poor. But lack of spiritual thoughts, because all they did was gambling when they are not farming. So we conducted various activities to reach their spiritual life to show them how the farmers outside who grew, even built a countryside library for our kids. Instead of just playing with our phones at home. So I hope by reading kids in the rural area could reach themselves. And we upheld festivals to celebrate our growing. And we also started to sort out waste. We will also carry out some activities that can have an influence on youth people. For example, in, Yi, in Jiangxi, we have set up two sessions of activities that invite youth people to come back to rural villages. We hope that we can do this together to really, really engage young people in rural development. We really welcome university students to have some rural experience, to really understand the life of villagers and farmers on on the ground. At the same time, and we're also having some dialogue, having some exchanges with related ecological enterprises. We hope by doing this, we can enable more people to pay attention to rural issues to farmers, village, and also agriculture. At the same time, we're also having some interaction activities with urban schools, for example, here you can see they are doing some handicraft. They are in the field so that we can have some interaction between the urban and rural areas because we have to 
enable those urban people, especially young people to understand how the food they eat get to the, their plate. So that they know better what is actually behind the food they are eating. We have also making some new ways to contribute to farmers. For example, in agriculture, our size is not very large. And that's why we tried to do more to innovate so as to involve more farmers here. However, we also found that you can't be too large in agriculture. You have to be moderate because with the larger size, there comes greater risk. Because agriculture to some extent depends on the weather. We have already overcome our technological bottlenecks, but in terms of marketing and sales, we also have some challenges. That's why we are also working with other partners in terms of production, supply, and marketing, and also in terms of credits, so that we can make contribution to rural development together. So I've been returned to my hometown for many years. I feel that villages are a lack of people, are lack of professionals. We know that agriculture is a very demanding job. It is labor intensive. That's why a lot of people have already gone to cities. There's almost no young people in villages right now. So we hope that while we are advancing rural revitalization, we can attract more young people to go back to rural areas, to go back to villages, because to revive rural economies, we have to have people. Because without people, you can't go anywhere. So how to attract people back to rural areas? How to ensure that when they come to come back to rural areas, they don't have to worry about their security? How can we engage more people? Our mission is to empower farmers to make a decent living. We hope that we can make farmers a respectable profession, make farming an attractive job. We should really change people's perception of agriculture as a very labor intensive job. And lastly, we want to make countryside a desirable home. And that's all for my sharing today. And thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Hui Feng. Uh, I, we see his experience as a returned use to his, uh, to his hometown and his exploration to start with himself to do organic farming, then lead uh, all the people in the village uh, to join, to establish the cooperative. His reflection also indicate that the people is the most important, but uh, the livelihood for them also uh, is a way, he has achieved a way to solve, to, achieve, uh, to, to establish the livelihood for the youth, also for the village farmers. And so this integration with youth and local farm village villages together is an approach or a way of to, uh, towards the rural, rural revitalization by establishing farmer cooperatives. Thanks, Huifeng. I think we can, you can remain. Later on, I saw several people raise their hands. Uh, um, I, I'm sure you might have a, a questions, but uh, we have two more cases. Uh, could you wait for a while? After the another two cases presented, then we will have the open forum. Okay, now, now we, we, we have a lady um, presenters, yeah? And uh, 
Miss Zhang Han uh, Zhang Han Min. She's from Bai Ethnic Group in Zhou Cheng Village, Dali, Yunnan Province. He is also the founder of Dali Lan Xu Cultural Development Limited and the co-founder of Dali, Dali Boji Zai Cultural Cooperatives. So he with his husband uh, returned to their hometown. Within 10 years, they achieved a lot by establishing a social enterprise linked with their local cultural craft, uh, uh, craft uh, Badik, I think Indonesia called Badik and blue dye. So I don't say more. Uh, let me invite uh, Han Mei, please. Uh, you have 50 minutes. And thank you for your introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my great pleasure to share my some of my thinking with you. So can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I would like to introduce myself a little bit. So I would like to share with you the story of a group of Smurfs in Dali. So I want to share with you what we are doing as Smurfs in Dali. Well, I rarely share my own wedding photo in a PVD, but I really want to share you my journey. I am from Bai Ethnic Group, and my partner and I are also from Dali. We got married and we had our foster child. And right now we've already had two. Uh, we are moving from rural areas to Beijing and then back to rural Dali. So in this whole process, we have been exploring. This is how we can understand ourselves and how we can understand the world. And also, I would like to share with you a very important village, Zhoucheng village in Yunnan. So this is my hometown. It has many titles. People used to call it an example of bi ethnic group. And it also the hometown of Tai Dying. When I was little, I had many imagination of Tai Dying. When I was working in Beijing, I actually missed my hometown, especially under the blue sky and also white cloud. People are working on tie dyeing. They're having some chit chat. They pay attention to each other, and they are doing this handicraft with happiness and enjoyment. So it is very beautiful. It is beautiful in that all of the materials actually come from the nature. And also when they are working on the handicraft, they are also interacting with each other. So it is very lovely. That's why tie dyeing, it's not just a handicraft. It is a way of living. So uh, that is the memory of my hometown. So when I was working in Beijing, I was thinking about returning back to our hometown. We used to work in international institutions. So we started to explore some possibilities. And finally, we decided to go back to our hometown. And the first thing we do after we went back to our hometown is to actually do some research into the current status of our tie dyeing industry in our local hometown in terms of the products, in terms of the industry, and also how international it is. And it is very impressive to say that one of my grannies passed away because of some diseases. And all of the machines were gone. And I was really sad. And I was also realized that without young people, no one can 
carry forward this tradition. That's why I quitted my job and went back to my hometown, to the Zhoucheng village. I really hope that we can empower traditional crafts to promote a rural revitalization. So when we first started our company, we had a very beautiful vision. We hope that women in our rural areas could carry their babies, sing songs, and support their family, and also die their way, tie die in their way to a happy life. That's why we have started a lot of explorations from there. So our first strategy is to stick to the tradition that is the origin of our inspiration. So we learn a lot from our oral history, from those items, and also the traditional skills. Actually, they are closely related to our way of style. For example, as you can see here, this is a good encounterment. In the center, there is the flower. And this work comes from a man in our village. He hopes that he can present this kind of beauty and also use his work to express people's interaction. So I was really moved by this artwork. So I started to collect a lot of old items. The beauty of our handicraft is because it is deeply rooted in our culture, deeply rooted in people's interactions. So it is not just about dye in a color, it is more about presenting the rural life, the lifestyle. So we started the first Baizu, by ethnic group dyeing and weaving museum to showcase people's, to showcase our history and our culture. And we're also setting up our own plantation And we also protect the biodiversity in our plantation. We have our own research team that is mostly made up of those uncles, elderly than 60 years old. They are collecting old items and also they are doing research. And the second strategy is to regenerate the craft, reinvent the craft. For example, in terms of technical innovation, we want to innovate the color. Mostly it is color, but we are drawing inspiration from biodiversity and we have created over 50 different colors and we want to standardize these colors we, so that we can know the specific color fastness of each color. Because in terms of our tradition, we rely on our life experience, but it's really hard for other people to engage in. That's why we try to standardize all of the tie dyeing process. And we also made many explorations with some science and research institute. So we really want to use that as an enabler to promote innovation in this industry. And the second type of innovation is product innovation. We want to combine the traditional craft with modern creativity. So in the center, as you can see, this is actually a gift to the Beijing Olympic Games. It has also attracted a lot of attention from the public. And thanks to that, our craft has attracted a lot of public attention. And we're also working with more than 20 plus brands. For example, with Vanco. And here, we're making a lot of product innovations. We hope that tie dyeing is not just an artwork. It can be accepted by young people. For example, a lot of the consumers are actually young people. Gen Zers, for example. So we want to engage more young people. This kind of Dali blue was actually selected as the companion gift of a conference. And now it has been a very popular color. And it is also playing a very important role in promoting industry development. 
So we want to mobilize forces from other players, and that is our third strategy. So we are not just focusing on performing and also watching. Instead, we offer immersive experience, research, and also exhibition. For example, we go to Silk Museum. We do our own ex exhibitions. We hope that people can see how our tie-dye is part of everyday life. And we also offer some courses. So we want to mobilize all of your sensors. You can taste it even, you can see it, you can feel it, you can touch it. So we want to make people to understand our group, our culture. And the fourth strategy is business innovation. This is also a focus for the past several years. We are called not just tie dyeing, but tie dyeing culture. So we want to connect with more business models. So from tie dyeing, uh, we can combine with tourism, research, creativity, e commerce, etc. And also for the business model, we are thinking about whether it can be scaled up, whether it is sustainable. And that's why we are worked on a new brand. One of our exhibitions was just opened years today. Because in Dali, many of the organizations are scattered. For example, one of our exhibitions named Jama, which was run by a male with the aim of supporting his family in the form of a food store. So after the opening up, we hope he could be evolved and spend more time to honing his own skills and contributing more and connecting more with this. So we hope what we do could interact more and exchange more. Other than we also have a wall exhibition and the restoration of an old street to cross over different industries, to combine different stories together. And what we do is help promoting the tourism for example, we also won a award and listed as one of the best programs in tourism development. So this is a communication in crossing over industries. So we do hope we could connect more craftsmanships. For example, an old man over 70 years old participated in our activity and he was so touched so he contributed his own handicraft to our organization in recent years above what i mentioned before i hope we could also enable rural construction since lanshu was born in community so we hope to give back to our community by training and building capacity like we trained our handicrafts. Now our weaving machines are reducing and our trainers are reducing. So we regathered these together to help their growing up. And at the same time, they also accompanied us. So the whole journey is a enjoyable journey for us seeing so many opportunities, exploring more stories. Of course, on top of that, we also have so many achievements. I know starting your own work is a long journey. And now we have our independent brand targeting certified customers and communities. So we know that our organization has become a platform for employment and income increase. 
combining different non-heritage in enterprises to boost our development. And this is what we achieved in the past few years. But I know that every achievement is because of every person involved. I actually know this sentence in the prime of life, supreme beauty. And the photo showed an old lady was, who was over 82 years old. She is so passionate, enjoying sharing her own sights. So no matter the old, the young, we can always co-share, co-construct in this commu community. So a group of Smurfs could live together, could realize our dreams. There are so many interesting stories in this community. The old and the Generation Z and the newborn babies, including artists, the newly graduated students. They are highly integrated with each other to share with each other. I know it just dawned on me that uh, what my organization have done in the past decade, we are inspired from the nature, just like the relationship between us. So in the countryside, with the help of the old, the youth, the handicrafts, with what we love, with the laughters, with the connections, what a beautiful image, right? So we hope the organization will represent what we are after in the future and create more in the future. So this is my sharing. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Hanmei. I think uh, we go through with you and it's a beautiful journey. I think you helped, you made us to feel the beauty of the um, by ethnic groups, uh, traditions, the crafts, but as we also feel the beauties uh, among the people's relations, the be beauties between the uh, the history and, and your linking between the traditions to the modern life, and also the beauties of linking between the urban and rural uh, people. Thank you very much, and we hope that sometimes we could all really see the products and can yes, use the products. <laughs> Mm -mm. Okay. Oh, mm. Okay. So now we have the last uh, presenter. He may be the youngest among the four, and uh, his name is Chenning. He has been actively involved in the community support agriculture, or in China we call socialized ecological culture, since he's a stu college student. After graduation, he has been working with um, several organizations working on the CSA. Yeah. And uh, now we invite him. He, he, now he's working with the Green Finger. It's also a social enterprise based on the uh, CSA model. And uh, now we would like to hear his experience working in a social enterprise, how, how his feelings, how his growth, and how his reflection. Xueling, please. Thank you, Mr. Zhang. 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 Thank you, Mr. I am Xuanning from Green Finger Organic Food Systems. Today I'm going to share with you the stories of our organization and some insights on sustainable food systems and organic agriculture. Founded in 2010 by three students from top universities in China by exploring new modes of food systems. We have been established for 12 years, and it's long. Our one, one of the founders was a student from Professor Wen. He was influenced by so many prestigious teachers, and in 2010, 
he came back to Zhuhai city to found the spring farm. Springfinger is one of the first CSA farms. And after 12 years of exploration, our major bases are now in Zhuhai city, in Guangzhou city, and our population is about 700. In addition to the farmers, we have a lot of farmers. We have a lot of farmers. We have a lot of farmers. And we have a lot of farmers. 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 鸡、鸭、牛，呃，包括我们现在马上要养鹌鹑啊，还有养的鸽子，呃，整个的是呃，没有太多的，就是能够形成一个小的循环。然后绿手指这十几年来呢，呃，我们培养了数几百个返乡的新农人，呃，这这些个新农人里面呢，有的是从绿手指工作过，然后也有的在我们绿手。We offered a two-month voluntary training service for two months, and now we can serve more than a hundred thousand of customers. And by the promotion of media like Douyin and their friend platforms, Green Figure is booming now. Since 2014. The Green Finger is assisting more than 300 new farmers to sell their agriculture products to help guarantee their quality because our position is only selling products meeting the organic standard. However, if you your products don't meet the standard but still grew under the standard, organization, then you can still sell it under our help, just like the rice we mentioned before. And these different bases involving many farmers, promoting organic chain. So our quality management is very high, sending expertise, to exchange and oversee our bases. Now nearly we have covered more than 300 farmers. So why we are organizing such a CSC farm? And why the organic model is still not the mainstream in China, even in the future? You know, 12 years ago, our founders, including many other staff inspired by Professor Wen, we started to reflect on issues of food system, three aspects involved, production, circulation, and consumption. In terms of food production, we are wasting food because of industrialized food production systems even before putting on the table. And waste them. So all these leftover dishes and uh, the empty plate campaign we are promoting now are all results of overproduction. And then the interests of farmers are very low, and the production and marketing are not matched each other. Just like what Mr. Yao shared before, we cooperated with Mr. Yao in 2014. Since we are focusing on vegetable plantation, more customers are interested in green vegetables. We are not capable of doing it. So we started our cooperation with many different organizations, including Mr. Yao. 
rights is necessary in Chinese people's food system. So we have cooperated with different parties. And what Mr. Yao faced was the unmatched production and marketing with the decline of the countryside. And in terms of food circulation, issues emerged, like the food mileage is prolonged. Vegetables produced in one province may be delivered in a far away province to sell. So many sectors, many parties are involved in this whole process. Maybe five to six sectors involving cost. And now speaking of commission and the overpackaging in the supermarket. I apologize for my noises. And now what organic agriculture faces is the counterfeited product and disguised logo. Okay, so let's talk about food consumption. What do we digest now? Nobody cares the origin of it, whether or not it meets standard. And the overdue of pesticides, the prices, and the health issues involved, all these problems are not reflected enough. So that's why our organization started to do. We are reflecting what kind of food system do we really need? First, producers and consumers make friends and reviews to trust. We hope producers and consumers can have direct communication. And also in our model, we should not just have the so-called concept of consumer is not God. Consumer is not God and money is not everything. So we are equal. So right now farmers are not a very respected professions, but in our green fingers and also our cooperatives, we are actually equal partners with farmers and our partners. And we want to ensure organic planning. We do not use chemical fertilizers, pesticides, antibiotics, antibiotics. And we also want to build agriculture and animal husbandry cycle and also promote local growth. Right now, China is very large. Different countries, different regions have different products. Of course, if you want to have products from another region, it's all totally okay, but we still promote production and consumption locally and seasonally. And we wanna know where food comes from, who grows it and how it is grown. You also need to understand farmers, agriculture, land and nature. Many of the children right now actually know nothing about the nature. They have eaten pork, but they've never saw pigs and they don't have basic understanding in agriculture. Of course, and we want to tap into the full potential of agriculture. We want to promote nature-based education. And we also have many practices. In 2010, we set up a CSA farm. Its business model is very different from traditional organic farms and or traditional agriculture farms. And the difference is that uh, we actually promote a risk sharing and revenue sharing. And we also offer pre-sale of long-term orders and also different from traditional models. We produce organically, whether we have obtained certification or not. Since 2010, we have already covered a wide range of areas. For example, we have vegetables, fresh produce, and also produced goods. And we also raise chicken, fish, etc. 
And we're also working with farmers. Many of the farmers actually graduate from some prestigious universities. For example, some of our previous speakers all graduate from prestigious universities. But there are also some farmers that may not have very high of education. But they have basic understanding of organic farming. Is it? It's cut, right? Jenny? The speaker is frozen. Mm. The internet connection is bad. Yeah. Okay. Jenny, can you hold on? Jinning, we cannot hear you. My internet connection was was broken just now. I'll get brief right now. Right now, there are some fault products in the industrial chain that can't be delivered to consumers. So we try to solve this issue by establishing a processing factory in our own space to reduce loss and damage. It is not just for ourselves, but also to reduce risk for other farmers. Because for all these years, we have already improved our protection against risks, but for other smallholders, They are not producing enough products to be processed by some big factories. That's why we will help them. Uh, we're also setting up an organic living space. Where I am right now is called Fengye Restaurant. To my left is a kindergarten. Now working for Greenfinger is not just working, it is a way of lifestyle. And your daily necessities can be covered and also can be offered very different experiences. And we're also setting up our e-commerce platforms to help new farmers to solve sales problems. Of course, for a single farmer, it has limited production capacity, but consumers have unlimited potential. And with the help of many other supporters, we all right, rolling out more products online. And for this year, we can reach 30,000, 30 million worth of orders. All of them are organic, organic, fresh produce. And out of that, 20 million would be for smallholders from across the country. And right now we are also setting up our own social media accounts to encourage farmers to speak out. Because of the pandemic, everybody is having a hard time. But we can buck the trend because we have set up our social media accounts, for example, TikTok, Red, and also other social media platforms. And by doing this, we have attracted a lot of consumers that have understanding of organic farming. And we also share with them our stories and our products. This is our shopping page. So in the introduction, we will include the production procedures and also the transportation procedures and all of this. And this is our dream. We want to build ourselves into the best CSE farm in China. We hope that more families could eat the organic vegetables we grow and in fact, 
right now we also have some difficulties for our youth people who have returned to villages. Our jobs are not that respected. So we also hope that in the future we can work with more dignity. And we also hope that we can encourage farmers in the surrounding areas, even across the whole country, to use eco-friendly agri-production methods to protect soil, to protect the land. And that is our dream in the future. And thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Okay. Thanks, Xuanning. I think uh, he present uh, one the model of CSA using the example of Green Finger where he's working. I think um, by now uh, all the four cases has been presented. I observe that no matter whether is a social organization supported platform to support the farmer cooperatives and products to market to increase income like good products commute or a youth return home led, uh, uh, led with, uh, with the villagers and established farmer cooperatives or as uh, uh, graduates who set up a, a CSA model, all of them are uh, similar, uh, same stand from the production, processing, and services are quite diversified uh, approach to support in all stages. So the social enterprise in the agricultural sector say, same stand, or, although the entry point is different, but it need to meet all the dimensions of the requirement from production to the um, processing and marketing to the consumer's table. But another important is uh, uh, cultural uh, innovation, social enterprise, really linking the traditions to the day current life, linking the old generation with the young generation, linking the rural to the urban. And uh, we see uh, the craft is a thread to bring a rural uh, revitalization through all the dimensions. And now we are uh, at the stage for open forum. And uh, I see uh, in the chat box, there are several questions addressed to different people, the case um, presenters. And uh, where we are seeing other people's questions typing in the chat box, I will read the uh, question has been raised. The first one is addressed to Mr. Fong. Is asking you, could you please share examples and the range of products of cooperatives under the Good Products Camille brand? And you can uh, uh, answer these questions. Can you answer these questions? Mr. Fong, maybe you can prepare this question. Uh, down. Uh. And thank you for your question. So as an e-commerce operator, Uh, we have major features in terms of our our practices. Uh, one example is in Sichuan, Ya'an. And the product is a type of citrus fruit. This is not a major fruit in China. In 2015, when we first did the survey, we found that this product tasted really good. However, the price was very low and the sailing channel was also very simplistic. During our survey, we found that the fruit tasted really well because of its natural environment. And at that time, the general public didn't know about this fruit. So we decided to work with local people to really 
elevate the brand. For example, we invited some celebrities to come to the field. And we also started a promotional campaign for the local region. And uh, under the theme of helping the local community, we help consumers to understand more about this citrus fruit so as to build the brand awareness and also boost the, boost the, the orders. So this is how we can you know, use a e-commerce approach to help to sell local citrus fruit. So in six years, we have boosted the sales dramatically. So previously, the price was 1.2 yuan, but now it is 3 yuan. So we are taking an e-commerce approach to really build a brand premium. And also because now farmers know that their products are very valuable, so they pay more attention to their farming. So in this process, we're actually connecting with farmers and also with distributors so as to create value together. Okay. And uh, the second question, thanks for Mr. Feng. Uh, and the second question is addressed to Hui Feng. So the question is, do you promote a diversified model for your organic rice farms to ensure improved incomes for your member farmers? So we will provide technology, technique, and seedling, and also we will be responsible for purchasing all of the products from farmers. So farmers could earn more income probably earn 500 to 800 more compared to the traditional way of doing agriculture. I will also do deep processing to improve the value added. And we also have activities to engage more farmers to try this ecological based agriculture. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, okay, so so it's uh, diversify not only the production but also processing some of the products, right? And also some services related to the experiential education for the city kids and uh, etc. And um, thanks, Hui Feng. So the third question is addressed to Han Min. Uh, could you explain more how you are dying communities? have developed and benefited from the four strategies you shared. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, Thank you for your question. 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 Thank you
towards different customers. 课程或者是设计活动，我们一起去探知传统文化的智慧。我觉得在这样的一个过程里面，我们的很多的阿姨啊，或者是我们的这些手艺人，他更能够提升自我的一个认知，然后呢，建立了很大的一个文化自信。当然，在这个过程当中，我觉得还比较重要的就是大家形成了这种绿色生态、和谐发展或者是多元的这样的一个幸福观。所以，其实很多的妇女大家进来的时候，大家都不太讲话。或者是都不太表达自己，到后来慢慢的能够很好的去表达自己，而且还会去呃给大家去介绍他们自己所认为的我们的这种传统文化之美。我觉得这个过程里面 ，So in this journey, growth is commonly seen while preserving the community resources and integrating it. Second of all, our brand. Are calling on different forces, like inheritors of nine heritages and different artists and enterprises, to ensure the inheritance of our unique craftsmanship and convert as well as connect to our modern society. So the job employment as well as the industrial growth. Could be achieved. What we do is connection, not only in community. One interesting fact is that while exploring the relations between human nature, between humans themselves, and by the representation of communities, we are passing. Our thoughts to people worldwide, our customers, our friends, they are all inspired in terms of lifestyle. For example, their children are now using things they've never used before. So no matter. In culture connection and the exploration of confidence of our culture, we are trying to know their own culture better and preserve the ecology better. So this is what we do. Thank you. That's all for my sharing. Hmm. Thanks, uh, Hanmi. Uh. This is the quite a uh, uh, kind of uh, quite a uh, often asked questions about the relationship of the social enterprise with the community who are involved, especially the traditional culture and traditional knowledge. So the benefit sharing is um, is quite important. And uh, thanks for your efforts. And uh, there are two. Um, Uh, questions addressed to Xueling is uh, quite a lot, and um, there's also a question to Xuanqi uh, about social entrepreneurship uh, club. What's the activities you are doing? So now I can ask uh, uh, Xueling to prepare because it's quite a long uh, more questions, so you can answer it briefly. So how uh, Xueling? The question is. How do you manage to produce organic food in industrialized countries with poison water system like your country? How do you ensure the quality of food? How about export of agricultural product? Is it involved farmers or agricultural based social enterprise? And how about the price farmers get? So you can, mm, so I can ask Xuanqi to answer the questions first. Then, yeah, about the club, what activities you've done, yeah. The social entrepreneurs are holding an annual meeting during the entrepreneur week. We have also established. A specialized website launching soon. Plus, we have a training platform, a training camp. 
covering more than 10 cities and accumulated 30 trainings, covered 30 people each time. So this club is a community based on WeChat, involving more than 10 communities. And in Chengdu, Wuhan, Dalian, these cities, we have also sub-organizations. We put these social enterprises together to establish some practical basis. So they could match more talents, more youth talents to practice in these spaces. So I think this is a club, a connection to pour different resources together. So more mm -hmm. people could share it. Okay, so that's okay. my answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Xuan Qi. So Xuanning, can you uh, briefly answer the question? As the time is quite approaching, yeah, to the close. Mm. Okay. Mm. Since I could hear clearly about the interpreting, so let me take the first question first about water pollution. Currently, according to what we know, at the list in the farms we are docking, the irrigation water is not contaminated following the national standard. And uh, you can look up to the standards online, which are very high. And all the farmers we are talking <coughs> are based in remote areas, not in the cities. So Green Finger, compared with that, is closer to the city, one hour driving. And uh, the second question about pricing, the agricultural products about green finger, all these prices are positioned by our farmers instead of ourselves. So if they are not experienced in pricing, we will give related advice. But the final say is on their hand, according to their cost. Okay. okay, so I think um, uh, the water pollution is, I think, everywhere, every country might happen, but it's not whole country will all be polluted, because China is a kind of a, a big uh, land areas with mountains and green uh, area. Uh, different locations and not everywhere are industrialized. So there's also national policy to control the water pollution. So I think um, it would be uh, kind of uh, 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 cannot be generalized as a one because there's also diversified uh, location. Yeah. And um, the price, uh, Shining has already answered, right? Yeah. Okay. So now we are, since we were going to have some free dialogue after this, so we are pursuing for the next, uh, uh, the last activities is that uh, we are inviting Mr. Marlo Bamalo to share his reflection and closing remarks as the next forum organizer, right? He is current director of the Ligawe Highlands Rural Bank and chairperson of the Operativang Ligas Nueva Siha, chairperson of Vizcaya Fresh Organic Associate. And he holds um, decades of experience uh, in the social development and agricultural sector. Now let, let us ask Mr. 
Marlo to to give us the his reflection after all this uh, sharing and exchange and um, closing remarks for today's uh, forum. Marlo, please. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. No. Can you hear me? Good afternoon to everyone. Okay. Uh, There's an echo. Hello, good afternoon. Now, can you hear me now? Yeah, it's okay now. Okay. Well, yes. Uh, I'll, I'll try to be short in this reflection in the interest of time, but just allow me to have uh, some reflections on the highlights of uh, this uh, forum this afternoon. And we're uh, lucky and happy to have Dr. Wen Taijun to be part or to deliver a keynote address in, in this forum. He discussed that uh, many big businesses in the Western world and even smaller ones are now transitioning to having social enterprises and uh, social entrepreneurship. And this is being brought about by three key issues that is now confronting the West. One is oversupply of capital. The other is that a lot of them are indebted. There is high level of death, we made mention of the US, and then there is high inflation rate, uh, which are, according to him, the root causes of capitalism and, and uh, the reason for, for this uh, transitioning. As opposed to the current trends in China, that there is the socialization, the organization, and the institutionalization leading to China's rural uh, revitalization strategy and that is transitioning from pro-capital to pro-poor, pro-environment, uh, rebuilding collective organizations consistent with cultural revitalization. And there is a call for going back to rural, sending 10 million of the people to do green development uh, and to have SE making a comeback. Uh, as, as opposed to the experience in, in the West. And this is very much attributable to the fact, and we have to remember that social entrepreneurship in China has been around for thousands of years. This kind of social resources, social asset building, and shared uh, river, shared resources, and all of those things have been there. And he mentioned the experience uh, that dates back to 1895 of a company that set up 10 or more than 20 businesses benefiting, setting up schools for children, benefiting the uh, large number of the community. And uh, he also reflected that the current SE now in China have their own mission, their own business models, and are contributing to social progress uh, and these local, uh, and these contemporary social enterprises are harnessing resources, uh, in his conclusion, to improve green innovations and support growth and uh, development. We also had uh, Dr. Liu, well, Mr. Liu Swanki, if I pronounce it right, uh, discussing the timelines and the history of social entrepreneurship in China. And this can be attributable to what they call Liyun Datung, or the origin of social custom. And I think this is where social 
sharing and traditions are coming from. So it started with, in 1875, the Dasing Yarn Mill experience of Wan Xiang, Xiang Jian through a joint stock system, raised social capital like a cooperative system and established uh, as is, uh, uh, benefiting a number of communities. And that beginnings were in 1895 up to 2015, where they had the Social Enterprise Forum in, in China. Uh, or, well, in 1918, there was a university social enterprise as a key part of the, the transition, and then SE Forum in 2015, up to the current, uh, the introduction and promulgation of local policies in Chengdu province in 2018, and eventually in Beijing. They also had social entrepreneurship awards in, in China. And I think we, well, uh, we, we also would like to have that, that, that kind of uh, recognition. Then uh, in, the, in the World Entrepreneurship Forum, they had 100 people campaigning uh, for communities in villages uh, to create community enterprises, transforming community uh, businesses to social enterprises. And that experiment uh, led to uh, villages embracing social entrepreneurship and through the social enterprise planet laboratory, uh, the future of social entrepreneurship uh, is that private SEs can be transformed into public service or social enterprises doing public service and public welfare organization to grow as social enterprises and the integration of social enterprises into mainstream, uh, not only welfare organizations, but current uh, 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 non-profit organizations and uh, envisioning that the future of China economy would have 10% uh, being uh, uh, the, the growth being contributed by 10% of social enterprises. We also had uh, three cases or four cases being shared. One is of the good products commune and uh, from uh, the critical bottlenecks reset thing, uh, rural industrialization, they endeavored to address that through setting key directions and with the village collective being transformed into cooperative as the motor as the key to the whole process of uh, farmers having a lot of problems to so farmers having dignity, eaters eat healthy, there is value realization for the farmers, utilizing e-commerce as a key to marketing and now a certified social enterprise under the certification system and envision, envisioning the promotion of revitalization of the rural economy, uh, benefiting community and having community investments to become very competitive. Now they are in 109 countries, 19 uh, 109 counties with 19 provinces and 138 cooperatives benefiting 40,000 of the household population. The other is a model by Yao Huiping I pronounced the name right on ecological farming cooperative. He is a classic story of a returned youth from the academe, established a community supported agriculture uh, initiative uh, in his own community from being a, uh, an intern in a CSA uh, uh, institution and returning back home as a happy farmer. He envisioned community supported agriculture as an ecology of production, an ecology of life, and an ecology of spirit. With people paying attention to farming uh, and with cooperation in the community together, he wanted to have farming as a respectable profession, 
to have farming as an attractive job and making countryside to become a desirable home. We also have a model on the from a blue batik model in Yunnan from a group of uh, smarts uh, between the Kangshan Mountain and Erha Lake, and from a learning experience to seeing the world and undergoing a renewal process to establishing a sustainable lifestyle. So they are a family working in international organizations and, and, and uh, the urban areas. And they went back to the village. And, uh, and established an, an age-old uh, uh, activity of tie-dyeing that is not just a handicap, but as a way of living and a commune between, between man and nature uh, and uh, embracing the wisdom of living in harmony. So from a from key strategies, they, they have mentioned five strategies from product innovation and skills innovation to rural, to enabling or capacity building, they call it rural construction. And from 200 teams uh, to a thousand craftsmen and 3000 villages, cultivating local culture. And this is an experience from a plain blue batik to becoming very popular from a group of smarts to practicing a sustainable lifestyle to love and uh, to love from community and, and, and nature. So that's another story. Another one is the story of uh, on sustainable food systems and, and organic agriculture that was uh, also shared uh, through the Green Fingers uh, experience of Sunning, if I uh, pronounce the name right, uh, with three students coming from the Renmin University, established Green Fingers, uh, and, and uh, Green Fingers, as, as they mentioned, uh, is one of the very first community supported agriculture initiatives in China, uh, inspired a hundred new farmers uh, and uh, uh, served thousands of uh, communities. So since 2014, Green Fingers has assisted 300 farmers and these 300 farmers as key to building community supported agriculture, changing the value system, the, the agricultural value chain control systems from product circulation to consumption that benefits a lot of intermediaries to a system that is community led, organic, a lifestyle that is nurtured and shared together inside the community, uh, doing co-creation and co-production uh, of food uh, that benefits the same community and host of other communities. I, I hope I have captured the discussion well. And as we close this particular forum this afternoon, we will open up a new one. And because this is a series of discussion about social entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship context uh, and, and the best practices in, in selected countries, the next would be uh, in December 1 to be led by our friends in rural reconstruction Nepal. With that, Dr. Xiang Lenying, thank you very much for having this opportunity. We now uh, close this, this forum. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks Marlo for your quite uh, precise summary about all what had been shared. And uh, we're looking for the future forum. By this chance, I would like to thank all the people who participate in this forum. And uh, thanks to ASIA's uh, whole support for this uh, 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 platform. And also thanks for the SFA team, uh, Longxia, 
and the Ruoyun from the Slain Southeast Asia Youth Network. And also thanks for the Earth Village to participate. And uh, thanks for our interpretation uh, worldwide uh, uh, company to do the uh, support in the interpretation, especially also to the Xuan who did the translation, uh, uh, English to Chinese translation. And uh, thanks for all the speakers. Uh, you bring quite a lot of diversified, uh, rich experience and perspective. I hope that um, following with them, people would like to have some more free dialogues and uh, chat uh, without so much kind of uh, uh, moderations. Thanks all. And uh, as people required for some PPTs, and we will summarize and put into writing and also consult with the presenters uh, before uh, we can uh, circulate to all of you who are interested.